Welcome to the Weekly Squeak, your weekly geeky squeak with me, as always, Chris Chinchilla. This week, I have an interview from a couple of weeks ago with Mark Pearson, who is a senior Linux developer at Lenovo, and Martin Wimpress, who is the engineering director of Desktop and Snapcraft at Canonical. And we will speak about their recent um, announcement and indeed rolling outness, I'm not sure quite what the right phrase there is, of um, Ubuntu native shipped on Lenovo laptops and how they got there and what that might mean for the future of uh, Ubuntu and Linux on laptops, I guess. But before we begin that, here are my first one that was covered a reasonable amount, um, but I am actually going to refer to the uh, source of truth the Kubernetes blog itself. Um, Kubernetes announced that it was dropping support for the Docker runtime, and everybody suddenly took this to mean the death knell of Docker itself. Now, whilst Docker has a very kind of um, interesting potential future with uh, how it sort of kicks out of this revolution and lots of people sort of almost forget it exists as a company, but that's, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, this blog post likes to point out that is not true. Uh, you can still use Docker um, containers and images as you have been for some time. They're just not using the runtime anymore. And actually all the runtimes that you can use in a container orchestrator like Kubernetes should run and work the same way anyway. So it's, it's an interesting blog post just sort of basically saying, calm down everybody, nothing to see here, nothing really to do, only in particular niche edge cases will you need to change anything or fix anything or do anything. And it's all okay, really. <laughs> we hope. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the new Max with M1. Two articles here focusing on why this might be interesting to developers. Number one, getting lots of pop-up ads here if you're watching the video, fun, fun. Number one from Larry Dignan on ZDNet um, about how AWS is going to be offering um, Apple Silicon instances on their EC2 cloud, which means that if you want to use them for whatever purpose, be that iOS or Mac app building, or whether that be um, using the neural core for some machine learning workloads, you can, I think now can, or uh, you will be able to, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and this means you get Big Sur and M1 support. What I'm wondering, which is not completely clear here, is if they already have um, Mac instances running Intel. I'm not 100% sure, I would guess so. <laughs> But it's interesting to see, and I wonder how many they bought. All these Mac Minis sort of racked up. It'd be quite fascinating to know how many there are. Following on from there, this is one on XDA developers by Skandra Hazikra, Hazir, Hazirka. Um, developers get Windows 10 and Linux to work in visualization on an Apple Silicon Mac. And this has kind of been one of the problematic aspects of the switch. Um, ARM versions of Linux and Windows exist, but uh, it wasn't officially supported. And the person in this particular instance, Alexander Graf, was using a particular piece of software, uh, QEMU, Quemu, uh, who actually works at AWS, I don't know if that's connected, did get both working um, and reasonably well, in fact, quite performantly. And it's it's interesting here because one of the main blockers for Windows is not technical, it's licensing. Um, Microsoft have not licensed it. Of course, you could probably figure out ways to run it if you really wanted to, but Linux is different. So there's no reason why you couldn't get uh, ARM Linux distributions to run within reason. I guess just nobody has really tested the virtualization software, well, obviously uh, QEMU, 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 however you say it, um, has got it working, but something like Parallels, which is what I use, 
they do not have a version that supports emulation on, or virtualization on Apple Silicon yet. But I think this is encouraging to show that it's um, actually possible. And look at this, yeah. There you go, here is someone running Fedora. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's fun to see. And fun to see that it's extremely performant, which maybe bothers Microsoft, who knows. Next, I have to click some cookie warnings. <laughs> Ron Miller on TechCrunch. Everyone has an opinion on the $27.7 billion Slack acquisition. I think I have forgot to turn off my turn on my ad blocker and suddenly realizing how many ads pages normally have. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, I have decided to switch to Safari this week and I'm suddenly realizing how many ads I was not getting in the past. I'll have to find an ad blocker. Um, so, Salesforce is buying Slack. I don't know how I feel about this. I have had experience with other pieces of the Salesforce in, uh, ecosystem and not been massively impressed with some of it. But then they also have Heroku and various other tools which do work just fine. So um, it could be that my concerns are unfounded. But it talks a lot here about how a lot of uh, enterprise companies, um, so Yammer was one um, that I can't even remember what, when I used to use it. I definitely used it at a certain point. Uh, it went to Microsoft and then it kind of vanished. They have uh, Atlassian with HipChat, that was sort of uh, something that people made and then it was lost and they ended up sort of migrating people to Slack as well. So. Enterprise companies have struggled to compete um, apart from Microsoft and Microsoft Teams. And this combined with the other applications and, and platforms that Salesforce has, it actually makes a lot of sense. I think people just think of the, the companies being quite different. But then again, I do say Salesforce also has Heroku, who I tend to think of more in this light. And... Um, so some people are starting to wonder if it's going to be a good match or not. It's a certainly a very good sales match, um, but the valuation that people have put on, on Slack uh, for this sale to some people seems quite high. And because Slack have actually not benefited as much as people would have expected from the current working from home trend. So that's another aspect. Um, so will they make back the money that Salesforce expect to make is, is one of the things here. Um, and so far, stock reaction has not been that favorable to it. So who knows? Who knows? We shall see what happens to Slack. We shall see what happens to Salesforce. And um, yeah, read more if you want to read more nuances on those opinions. Next, I love a bit of computing history. This is an article on by Jay Hoffman on the history of the web.com. There's been quite a few um, of these uh, recently. Actually, I've been reading them along, but I love the one about why do we call it a home page? Uh, and it's all got weird connections back to Apple. Well, actually, Steve Jobs and Next Computers and uh, Tim Berners Lee just uh, thinking it was, I suppose, kind of a nice word. He wanted it to be, here we go, down here. That space on the web, Berners-Lee called it a homepage, a place that you can make your own, basically. So it's actually supposed to be more of your own personal homepage, not the homepage of every website. Although you could argue, of course, that the maintainer of the website, that is their homepage. Even if it is one person or a 30,000 people company, it's still someone's homepage. <laughs> but the history of the, the early web is paved with examples like this where it, someone else came along and changed it fundamentally and kind of reinvented what it actually means. Um, and yeah, that's yet another example where Tim Berners-Lee especially, he kind of had a, a fairly um, narrow vision of what the web would be. And many people who came after that really blew it open into what it became. And this is quite a nice article. You can see some real um, flashbacks and trips down memory lane here to to uh, old web pages from the 90s. <laughs> These great low low resolution images and, and things like that. 
And finally, a article from New York magazine on New yeah New York Vulture. Um, their Vulture uh, supplement, I guess, uh, by Molly Young. Uh, I really love this garbage language. Why do corporations speak the way they do? Have you ever found yourself in meetings of people throwing out words that really are meaningless and don't mean anything to you? And you wonder what exactly they do mean and why people say them and then why everyone else decides to say them, even though no one really knows what they mean <laughs> and on it goes. And uh, this is quite a wonderful, if slightly biting article about um, why that happens, how that happens, what people really mean when it happens. Yeah, I love some of these uh, repurposing of uh, stock photos here. Do you have the bandwidth to drill down this? I'll block out a touch base on my cal and we'll figure out how to operationalize. I love intentionally not using all these sorts of words, I must admit, to try and blow through a lot of this jargon as much as possible. But yeah, it's a great read and you will either laugh, cry or both. <laughs> And that was one of my links for the week. And now is my interview with Martin and Mark from Canonical and Lenovo to talk about Ubuntu running on Lenovo laptops. Enjoy. I'm Mark Pearson. Uh, I'm the uh, technical lead for the uh, Linux PC team here at Lenovo. Uh, and so, yeah, my, my, my main role is to get Linux working on our, on our platforms. Uh, it's, uh, it's an awesome experience. Hello, and uh, I'm Martin Wimpress. I'm the engineering director for the Ubuntu desktop team at Canonical. Now, I've actually spoken to Canonical people a couple of times, mostly around um, your kind of cloud server infrastructure type stuff, usually at KubeCon or something like that. We haven't really spoken much about the, the desktop before, though I have covered just releases. I mean, let's just start because uh, I think um, Canonical has had a sort of on-off, and I don't mean that in a bad way, just in terms of a, a business, I suppose, relationship with Dell, I think, for some time. There's, Dell have released occasionally kind of um, Ubuntu pre-installed laptops. But I know a lot of people have always used ThinkPads. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and to be honest with you, most of the people I see running um, Linux full stop are often actually using ThinkPads. I guess mm -hmm. some of the connection there is historical as well. Mm -hmm. But um, just to, so just to clarify, first and foremost, um, this, this relationship has been predominantly on the ThinkPad and the ThinkStation, which I'm guessing is desktop, I think. Uh, I'm guessing. Well, so we, we have a few, there's uh, ThinkPads, the workstation is probably the, the biggest okay. part. So, and they have mobile workstations and the desktop. So both, both workstations and then there's Think Center, which are desktops as well. Oh, just, just I mean, I mean, purely for the, the Canonical partnership, not, not. Oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 so, well, yeah. so, no, but we, yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, 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 this is yeah. for the Canonical one. So this oh, okay, is what okay. we are doing, the Ubuntu preload on, I, I believe it's 27 platforms in total. Okay, um, wow, okay. So, so yeah, no, it's, it's quite, Quite a, quite a range of them, and it covers covers a lot. And is this new, or has it actually existed for some time, but no. just you decided to make more of an announcement of it this time? No, uh, we've been working with uh, Canonical, uh, doing Ubuntu preloads and certification for, oh man, uh, so I, I joined the PC team last year, so Martin, it, I, I, it's quite a few years, um, but it was a custom bid uh, um, offering. So if you wanted the Ubuntu yeah, preload, okay. it was custom bid. And, and yeah, we're just seeing increased demand on Linux. We're having customers asking for Linux, um, part of our Lenovo uh, smarter technology for and, and it, yeah, it makes sense. I think Linux uses okay. So yeah, we've had it. We've been, we've been working together for, for years, but it made sense to expand, expand it. Okay. And as far as I know, this also isn't necessarily your first kind of pre-install specific build for a Linux distribution? Like you, I've seen some things saying you've done Fedora before, but maybe oh, that's wrong. Right. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, and and yeah. well, both, 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 both in power. So yeah, we work with the Fedora community as okay. well. And we, we've had some okay. Fedora preload systems too. Okay. And I guess from the canonical side, what, 
I mean, there's obviously some very obvious things you get out of it, but what, <laughs> what, are, what are some of the, especially for, you know, a user base that is, you know, fairly familiar with, with fiddling around and, and hacking things together and getting things working themselves and, and being mo moderately happy with it. What's the positives for you? Well, that audience certainly exists. You know, mm. I, I would I would classify that description as like your Linux desktop enthusiast. And I would firmly put myself in that category. You know, I've been running Linux on the on the desktop, you know, be that laptops or workstations on a full time basis since the 90s. Um, and it's my productive environment. It's where I am comfortable. It's where I can get things done. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's another class of users that I think we're able to tap into through the um, enablements we do with, you know, the tier one OEMs such as the Novo, mm -hmm. which is professional developers who also want to get things done and for whom Linux is the productive environment that they want to be on. Now, just because they are smart, capable people who write code that targets Linux, and maybe they're <laughs> writing code that targets Linux in the cloud, or maybe they're working on AI ML modeling, it doesn't preclude, preclude them from wanting current, contemporary, up-to-date hardware with all of the latest features that arrives nicely packaged that they can just open and start working with. So while that, you know, desktop enthusiast audience exists, they will self-serve. But for mm -hmm. professionals and particularly professionals in enterprises who are looking to, you know, deploy workstations and manage workstations at scale, having these agreements and these preloads from the big OEMs means that we can satisfy that enterprise audience with yeah. a yeah. procurement process that they're fam familiar with. Yeah, and I know I've, I've, I've definitely been in environments where that's the case where, you know, Installing Linux on a work-issued laptop is effectively kind of breaking it for the enterprise team, so they would really no. even do it. <laughs> and and, and I, know, I know I talk to, to, to lots of users, customers, who, who are just happy they can get it, they know it's going to work, they know that all of the hardware is going to work well. One of the things right. is Lenovo's yep. working with the hardware vendors, we're making sure support goes upstream, we're working with the engineer, and so you get it. I'd like, I'd like it to works. dig into that point in a, in a bit oh, more in a minute, because that's probably one of the, the big areas of discussion. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> but just, just one other, is this, is this just in a couple of regions, or is it a global release as well? It, it's, a, it's a global release. Um, we're still still rolling out. It's at, it's, I mean, so we've got our first platforms around in North America, uh, okay. US and Canada. But no, it is, the plan is global release. It, Cogs have to turn, um, but yes, it's over yep. the next yep. year. We should see them see them roll out. That's, that's and the is intent. that mostly going to be? I mean, obviously at the moment we're in a slightly different time, but is that mostly mail order, or could it also walk into a store? <laughs> Some stores. I think it's all online. It's web yeah. sales. Uh, I, yeah. I have not bought a computer in a store in a, in a very long time anyway, so <laughs> I just wondered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so let's come back to that point here because, I mean, I think ThinkPads have been largely um, sort of reasonable for Linux users to get started with, but the, the big stumbling block for many installers of, of Linux onto any machine is usually firstly getting around the Windows and BIOS security issues hmm. uh, and boot issues and things like that. Um, and then there's the drivers. It, it does this card interface, etc., work out of the box if I have to do something. Yep. Um, so how different is the hardware from your quote unquote normal versions of these laptops? Oh, no, no, it's, that, it's the same. It's, it's the same. So, okay. that, so if you buy the Windows version or the Linux, it's the same, exactly the same. Okay. No. Uh, yes. Absolutely, totally. No. Okay. And you know that that enables us to do something nice as well. Because yeah. let's imagine that you um, buy a Lenovo SKU pre-installed with Windows, and then a year down the track, uh, you, yeah. you find that actually Ubuntu is a great place for you to be doing the work you're doing. You can re you can install that laptop or dual boot that laptop with the Ubuntu GA release, so the, mm -hmm. the regular image that we put out there for those desktop enthusiasts, and either during the install or post-install, if you've pre-installed it, it will detect if you are running on a certified device, even if it yeah. didn't come with Ubuntu, and it will enable 
all of the additional tuning and tweaks and capabilities specific to that device to give you as very close to the factory experience that we can deliver via that update mechanism. Nice, okay. And so it feels like this might have been a slightly long play to get to this point of making sure on both sides that the hardware chosen and the, and the driver support was kind of contributed upstream, as you said, on, on all sides over a period of time or? It, yeah. it, de it definitely evolves for sure. And I mean, we're, we're still learning in, a, in all mm -hmm. honesty. There's still, there's, there's always, there's always improvements to be had, always. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I, and I think that's part of why we're now in, a, we're at the stage where we can make them available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's good. So, okay. and I, I think, um, Martin would be able to say better, but I think that's driven by increased demand for Linux as well. I think yeah. that really helps. Yeah. Oh, that's a, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let's let's dig into that a little bit, actually, because the 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 statistics on that have gone up and down a bit the past year. Some people blaming work from home calls and things like that, but largely it's been on the up. Yeah. We, you know, within the limited metrics that we have available yeah. we are seeing an increase in the use of ubuntu and you know if you canvas the other distribution communities they will tell you the same mm. um but it's not a well measured thing so it's a little bit of a dark art but you know the one definite tangible that i can point to is the work that we do with enterprise customers um the most popular white paper on the Ubuntu website is the enabling Active Directory authentication for <laughs> desktop um, <laughs> desktop computers, uh, which is why you know one of the things we did this last cycle for the 2010 release is to integrate Active Directory enrollment into mm. the installer, um, and certainly the regularity with which significant enterprises are talking to me and the rest of the team at Canonical about their sort of at scale deployments of desktop and workstations um it, it used to be we would talk about tens and hundreds of devices and we're now talking about thousands and tens of thousands of mm -hmm. devices that are, are being delivered you know into enterprises and they're you know working with us and collaborating with us in order to you know make that a successful transition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i guess on the hardware side how how helpful have some of the vendors been in contributing to driver support and things like that? Or is it largely a community effort? No, no, no. It, uh, it, we work with lots of different hardware vendors. Uh, I'd say positive. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. It, it, it's genuinely positive. They're, they're receptive. They, they get it, uh, which is, okay. from my point of view, fantastic, right? That's <laughs> what, what I want is Linux support upstream so that, so that it works. Okay. And and just digging into some of the details of some of the hardware, I notice, and from memory, things like Yoga and um, Carbon to a lesser extent with the convertible machines, I think. Okay. Is that true? Yeah, uh, so, well, the Yoga's got the, the screen that you can flip yeah. on the back. Yeah. And, and I have found that support for that in Linux in the past was it's, sketchy. It's improving. It's improving, okay, good. <laughs> that, that, that's actually, that's probably more a question for Martin, but I know um, yeah. there's, been, there's been some work on improving okay. that experience on the yeah, Yoga. I'd love to hear some feature. of that, because that has when I last had a yeah. Yoga, that was my main negative. It was like, ah, damn it. Yeah, no, the, 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 yeah, no with the sensors for the screen okay. positioning, yeah. No, there's, there's been work done to improve that. Um, there has. I don't actually have okay. No, I, I don't either, although we do have them sort of uh, within our QA labs. So that was an area of improvement for us. And, and I say us, you know, um, engineers at Canonical that work on Ubuntu have uh, helped improve that two-in-one experience. Uh, some of the issues that, you know, people were citing was uh, the accelerometer support, the sensor support mm -hmm. wasn't great. So when you rotate the devices, the screen doesn't, you know, necessarily pick up the fact that it's it's had its screen inverted or flipped or what have you. And when that happens, sometimes the on-screen keyboard will appear and then it won't disappear reliably. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, claim that Canonical have done all of this work, yep. but yep. we are one of the organisations that contribute to upstream GNOME that have a vested interest in making yep. sure that desktop Linux works well on these devices. I I am told that um, those two-in-one devices make up a significant proportion of um, uh, laptop sales. And, you know, we can't ignore that and just go, oh, well, it's a shame that doesn't work very well. You know, we need to make sure that it works well on all of those devices because yep. obviously... 
professionals that are going to be using laptops uh, and workstations, those um, the applications that you're going to be running and the development that you're going to be doing, that's going to constrain over the time. You're going to be able to do more and more on mobile devices. So we need yeah, to make yeah. sure that the the workstation, the desktop, the laptop, the mobile laptop are all great places to run Linux for those people that need to use a desktop operating system to get stuff done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and that ties to that ties into what Lenovo want as well. We want people to yeah. buy our products and have a really good Linux experience on them. That's, yeah. that's where we're aiming. And, and yeah, I'll agree. I, there's, there's still pain points, but they, I think Linux is really getting to the stage where it's, I, I use it and it's a pleasure to use, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if, if, if it isn't, it gets down to a much higher or lower level, depending how you look at it, in, which is harder for you to control. Things like, right. I don't know, um, graphical editors for video or something, which is, has always traditionally been a case that was a bit hard on Linux, but has got a lot better. But there's not so much you can do to affect that. You know? <laughs> so, well, so. what we can do is provide demand to encourage yeah. ISVs yeah. to bring their software to the platform. You know, there's a little yeah. bit of chicken and egg there, but there are also yeah. several high quality video editors. You know, some of the it was just things an example. that people it will was cite a, now. It was a stereotypical example, but they have got <clears> yeah. better, yes. <laughs> no, I think we, 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 have, we have customers in the media and entertainment. Indeed. Yeah. And something like OBS now, which I've been using a lot recently, is, is incredible and open source on all platforms. So, <laughs> so it's fine. Um, just out of interest, how much of these contributions will go back up upstream to Debian and then thus other yeah. Ubuntu-derived yeah. um, distributions as well? Should be absolutely okay. everything. So that, and just from my point of view, that's really important. It's part of how Lenovo was doing this and, and and canonical with ubuntu are fantastic for this it's, and 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 the, the other distro engine we work with too but yeah it has to go upstream because one of the joys of linux is the choice um so yeah uh, upstream and then everybody yeah okay. and just to just to sort of you know build on that um the majority of the desktop team um employed by canonical are also debian developers okay. And, you know, we uh, do our work upstream first. So, you know, if we're working on something, we will actually do that work in Debian and then have that, you know, come downstream back into Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and a little segue, I, Lenovo are contributing upstream directly as yep. well. We have, we, we have not still still growing, but we are, we are contributing patches to the kernel and we're learning. Okay. So, yeah, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, you're obviously pitching this and then a lot of the, the press releases around this too at the kind of developer audience, which has traditionally been the, the Linux audience. And um, for the most part, it's it's a, a, a best slash better option for developers. But how much, how much of this do you think will help bring out some of the other uh, user base as well? Uh, specifically, I mean, I'm thinking, I don't, this might just be me with my sort of, prying hat on that there's a little bit of a play here against things like um chrome os as well to just be you know that ability to have a device that is off the shelf is an alternative is is possibly useful to get that non-developer audience as well or is that really not the market at the moment <laughs> um yes no so uh yeah, I think we're still evaluating where the Linux program goes. It's, uh, yeah, so right now, it's only busy. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, in, so I, I, yeah, I can't really comment on, on the future plans. Fair think, enough. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In terms of sort of Ubuntu, um, you know, Ubuntu's tagline right at the very beginning was Linux for human beings. And it was very mm -hmm. much sort of, you know, exactly. targeting that perhaps inquisitive audience that were looking for another option. Uh, and although the tagline has changed over time and, you know, our focus has shifted on the desktop to satisfying the needs of, you know, people that want to get serious work done. Uh, the mm -hmm. fact is that, you know, developers are, you know, end users too. And that they want to do all the same <laughs> things that regular users want to do. You know, they want to be able to listen to their music on yeah. Spotify and watch their, you know, TV shows on Netflix or Amazon Prime or what have you. So, you know, all of that stuff has to work to satisfy any any audience of computer user these days. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, and that's obviously been some things that uh, Canonical has pushed hard on with things like Snapstore and stuff like that, which... 
has sort of had varying levels of success depending on on the developer, I suppose. But it's it's certainly it's certainly trying to get that similar experience. So and, yeah. when I introduced myself, I said I'm the engineer and director for Ubuntu Desktop. I'm also engineer and director for Snapcraft. So you know ah. I can speak a little bit to that. <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't say it's had varying levels of success. I would say it's been wildly successful. You know, we I, have... I, I know, I know. In certain <laughs> corners, it's not as it's in certain corners, it's controversial. In certain corners, people. Whenever you, uh, yeah. <laughs> whenever you know, when, whenever you you know st stand up, you know, and proudly bring something new to the world, you're going to have to take wind in the face, right? So you know, there are definitely people that prefer the traditional way of doing things. But when you speak to ISVs and you explain that, you know, Snapcraft is the app store for Linux, that they understand what that means immediately. Mm. And, you know, it's the work of the mobile platforms that have popularized that paradigm. Uh, and of course, it's available on the Mac OS desktop, it's available on the Windows yeah. desktop. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we needed that means for ISVs to reach an audience and for an audience to come and find their software. And yeah. despite some of the controversy, it's been... Uh, very successful and again like the desktop we're continually working to improve that experience yeah I think that's always been the case it's like you know the nice thing with Linux is you don't have to use it if you don't want to <laughs> so, you know, just, so. yeah no it's, that, it's kind of one of the joys of Linux right? yeah you, you yeah. have control over over your your experience I guess we should ask the important question uh, to you Mark what what what's the what's the what's the key on the keyboard? Oh, no. <laughs> same hardware, same hardware. It's, no, it, it's it's still it's, it's still the same key. It's, uh, and, 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 and no, it really does feed back. It's the same hardware. I, I've had this question before, and uh, and I, I actually quite enjoy it. But uh, yeah, same hardware, same key. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you still have the the. I mean, what about is there still the the sticker on the underside as well from no. from Microsoft or is that no. gone? No, 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 no. Okay, that's, that's gone. Okay, good. <laughs> I have to. I, I say that with confidence, but no, there <laughs> shouldn't be a Microsoft stickers on sticker on the Linux payload. That no. Um, okay. No, that, that and is, actually, the follow up and no. interesting question to that is: Does it make yeah. these slightly cheaper because there's not the licensing fee? So uh, I I don't control pricing. pricing yeah, I just by the, yeah. It's pricing yeah. set by the GOs. The the ones yeah. in the US have been so far, but it's, yeah. that's not. Not, not what I, I get any saying. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, so you have a range at the moment of, I think it was uh, 30 something? Yep, well, 30. I, I think 2020, 20, 27, okay, 28 right, okay. uh, it is, yeah. is what's planned. Uh, I believe we have four or five up online yeah. right now, but they're, they're coming okay. through, they go through the process. We have we have a lot of tech. We do the canonical certification. We do internal testing. We do energy okay. cert. It, it's, yeah, there, there's a process, but they should all be popping up. Okay, and so that would be my, my next question is usually like, what's the plan? But the plan, the, the future plan, the future plan is still the present plan, I suppose. Oh, absolutely. Yes, no, we're, we're, we're executing so. on it right now. It uh, keeps me busy. Um, yeah. yeah, that that, that the, the you know, and and I mean the PC world is is, is fascinating how fast it moves. Uh, so yeah, we're looking at next year's yeah, platforms. Exactly. I'm looking at 2022 platforms, and we're planning for those. And it, it's a beast. Okay, and I guess a, a question for for Martin. And I mean, Mark, you can put your fingers in your ears if you like right now. <laughs> uh, so you've had the partnerships with Dell and Lenovo, and there's obviously the kind of more niche vendors as well, like System76 and things like that. Are there any other vendors planned for the future? In all honesty, I can't think of any other obvious ones outside of Dell and Lenovo, but there might be some I've missed. So <laughs> we're, we're working with the three uh, tier one vendors, which is Lenovo, Dell, and HP. Okay, all right. And, um, and then yeah. there is a whole, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, economy of, you know, uh, other vendors doing, you know, different types of, you know, Linux preloads, but... Uh, we're not. We don't have any commercial relationship with with any of those. They're the main ones I've seen. I think I sometimes see some Alienware just for the people who really want the kind of hardcore setup. But there's probably a lot of driver issues with, with I, that. I wouldn't I'm know. Sure. I mean, that's a Dell <laughs> Dell brand these days. But I'm not aware yeah, of, yeah. of Alienware yeah. being in the portfolio of things that we've ever worked yeah. on. 
And I suppose the the other question is, uh, what's the what's the reception been like in terms of user feedback? In terms of if you want to talk about it, sales as well. I mean, in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, I, I don't have sales yeah. numbers to share for sure. Um, yeah. But overall, the um, feedback's been really positive. Re really, mm. really good. Uh, I mean, we've been working hard on this for a while to get it <laughs> ready, um, and we've still got a long way to go. But no, overall. Uh, the, the Linux community is amazing, right? Uh, and Linux users are really enthusiastic and it's a, a positive and really engaged uh, community. So, no, from my, from my point of view, it's, uh, it's it's been really good. I, okay. Overall, overwhelmingly positive, actually. Yeah. Okay. You know, speaking on behalf of the, you know, Linux community, the Linux desktop enthusiast community, I think that, you know, this year's announcements about the expansion of, you know, Lenovo and HP's interest in desktop Linux were an injection of, you know, positivity, mm -hmm. you know, for and validation for, you know, Linux users everywhere, seeing that, you know, major OEMs are getting behind yep. the platform that they've they've chosen. And, you know, it, it signals there's a healthy ecosystem out there, you know, there, there's clearly an audience for, you know, uh, quality devices running desktop Linux. And that was my interview with Martin and Mark talking about Ubuntu running on the Lenovo. Hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you're okay with the edits. Getting three speakers is uh, it's kind of an interesting editing decision what to do there exactly. Anyway, now time for updates from me. Here's my lovely website. As always, I have spoken at two events in the past week. You can find details of those talks on the events page. I added them here, although now the past events. There's API of the Days. I just did that and write the docs. Um, and that, that video should be on YouTube at some point soon. Um, quite a few things to update you on, actually. Um, solo Adventurer, uh, Solo D&D, &D, the uh, Frozen Offerings Part 2 happened on the on my Twitch, on my YouTube channels for Solo Adventurer. And there was also, I did, um, I think I need to update the feed again, Dexpose happened with Rollbar, following up from my interview with Brian Rue last week. So you can have a look at how I got on with Rollbar. Episode 3 or 103 of the Board Game Jerk podcast is live. You can listen to it on the website or go and click on the link and uh, find details of where to get it in any podcast platform. Equally, which is what is missing here right now, episode 3 of Stories About People went live yesterday. There's a story from me and a story from my co-host, co-storyteller, Susie. So you can also find that. I'll update the webpage just as I finish recording this um, yeah, and I mean, we're starting to wind down now. I don't think there's too much else to update you here. Uh, my new newsletters are very, very nearly ready. I am still testing and getting the MailChimp profiles working, but you can go over to newsletters and sign up for my general newsletter in the meantime. So yeah, that was my update from me. That has been another weekly squeak. And I think they're probably going to be doing one or two more before the end of the year and then take a short break. If you have enjoyed the show, please rate, review, share, leave a comment, get in touch at christianchiller.com. Love to hear from you. Love to hear feedback. If you want to come on the show, you can also find my contact details there. And um, if you have something interesting to talk about, I'd love to speak to you. So until next time, if you have been, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you.